Thank you, uh, Marie, for the very gracious introduction, and thanks to Christian and the psychiatrist for the invitation. Um, I'm looking forward to sharing some uh, new and unpublished work, actually, uh, from our lab, and it's actually great that Marie uh, gave some background, and that frees me up to look uh, uh, forward uh, as well. And a lot of what we do is very relevant to psychiatry, but also to basic uh, fundamental neuroscience. My own clinical work uh, is uh, specializing in treatment-resistant depression, and I also have an interest in autism spectrum disease. These are, of course, complicated, uh, difficult to uh, uh, treat medically, and we need deeper understanding, as we do uh, for all psychiatric diseases. But the same principles apply uh, in neuroscience and, indeed, in, in much of biology. We need improved uh, tools to understand how the system works without disassembling it. And uh, some of the methods that I, I share with you are, are really focused on this, uh, this question. Now, um, I will look forward in this uh, mostly. i show you new and, and unpublished data, uh, uh, but there will be a couple historical interludes. And I thought, you know, psychiatrists will know this literature, but since there may be a, more of a broad audience, uh, looking back about uh, 200 years, there were two things going on uh, that uh, related in different ways. There are threads that uh, currently are being still woven together uh, now. On the one hand, we have some of the earliest uh, scientific descriptions of psychiatric disease states and symptoms, and uh, indeed a uh, very cogent uh, and calm description of anhedonia, what we would now call anhedonia familiar to people who study madness and melancholy, uh, uh, of course. People neglect those objects and pursuits which formally prove sources of delight and instruction. And at the same time, uh, uh, in the early 1800s, you had the first uh, interventional uh, experimental neuroscience, removing uh, parts of the brain and showing that different uh, parts, uh, uh, at least uh, to some level of approximation, had different roles. There was not an aggregate field, but there was a cellular connectionism. One part of the brain played a role in breathing, another in movement, with memory perhaps being more uh, delocalized. This was an interesting guy. He, his uh, son, uh, Gustave, was actually a, a, a late uh, 19th century uh, revolutionary, uh, and he himself uh, was also a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. The John Haslam uh, was also well, uh, you know, uh, uh, remembered in history for uh, a very clear description of uh, perhaps the first uh, uh, patient described in the scientific literature with uh, what we would now call uh, uh, chronic paranoid schizophrenia. And this, uh, again, the psychiatrist may know this, but it's uh, something that is so fascinating that uh, I thought I would bring it up here, and, and there are, uh, again, threads that link it to the work that, that I'll tell you about. Uh, in schizophrenia, uh, as we know, there is, are often delusions of control and external forces that are uh, imposed upon our patients. These are often couched in modern form in, in terms of modern technology, satellites, lasers, the uh, NSA, and so on. And we have, in this uh, time, without lasers or satellites, a uh, loom, the air loom. This patient, uh, James Tilly Matthews, had this perception that there was a uh, a weaving machine that was uh, casting threads uh, through space and exerting control over himself and other people. And I find this uh, incredibly evocative. It shows uh, how this action at a distance and this uh, uh, machinery and technology that seemed imposing and, and complicated was uh, enfolded in and expressed in the, in the delusion. Now these, of course, are still and may remain so uh, uh, incompletely understood uh, uh, for a long time, but what you'll see is we now can, are starting to link the uh, connectionism that uh, is now defined and precise with certain symptom domains in uh, psychiatry, and that's uh, been uh, particularly exciting. Now, needless to say, the biggest mysteries of the human brain will likely remain uh, uh, well hidden for a long time. But the optical tools bring new perspectives. We can see into intact brains. We can see connections that project across long distances and label them. This is with the clarity method. We can play in activity patterns through fiber optics into behaving animals and turn up or down the activity levels in specific connections that uh, exert controls over, as in this example, anxiety-related behaviors. 
and we can observe activity patterns uh, at the population level, the projection level, and even at the cellular level within uh, behaving animals. And I'll show you examples of all of these. In fact, I'll uh, share with you work from these uh, three extremely talented postdoctoral fellows uh, with some of the very latest uh, uh, results uh, in, in along these lines. The first that I wanted to share is, is uh, still in press, but uh, it's, this is work led by Priya Rajasethupathy in the lab, an extremely talented MD-PhD uh, postdoctoral fellow. And she came to the lab with a history of thinking about memory and particularly interested in finding pathways that could exert top-down control of memory. And by that, I mean uh, higher level cortical and executive function areas that could uh, directly connect with subcortical memory structures like the hippocampus. And this has been uh, long hypothesized. The directness is under debate. In fact, the common uh, uh, level of knowledge in the field is that while there are strong projections from the hippocampus to prefrontal cortex, which are well known to play a role in the uh, consolidation uh, phase of uh, memory and long-term memory, uh, a lay down, there was not a well-described uh, top-down control pathway from prefrontal cortex uh, directly uh, to hippocampus, despite much uh, consideration that this could be uh, of interest. And as psychiatrists, we have a uh, perception that uh, also the uh, dysfunctions that we see in depression, for example, in prefrontal cortex and hippocampus and imaging, uh, that there may be some uh, top-down direct link that, that is of interest. But it wasn't known, uh, and we saw, uh, or Priya saw, an opportunity to begin to explore this question using a global unbiased uh, search, uh, using a combination of anatomical and optical methods. And she found something very interesting. So it began with, a uh, unbiased search she injected into the CA3, CA1 regions of hippocampus, dorsal hippocampus, a rabies virus carrying a fluorescent uh, gene encoding a fluorescent tracer. And the rabies virus will infect axon terminals very robustly, and uh, the cell bodies that give rise to those axon terminals, wherever they will be across the brain, will be filled and labeled with the dye. And so she allowed this to happen and saw many things that she expected. For example, an injection into one hippocampal uh, CA3 subfield field gave rise to strong expression in the uh, contralateral hippocampal CA3 subfield. And this is known, uh, of course, to occur through the uh, 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 fornical connections uh, that are, are well characterized. Other well-known projections, for example, from medial septum were also observed, uh, suggesting that there was a uh, 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 this was a valid uh, uh, method. But she saw something that was uh, unexpected as well, which is a uh, population of cells, uh, more or less specifically in anterior cingulate cortex and near it. Uh, it was consistent from animal to animal, not an enormous population, but uh, 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 clear and consistent. And uh, this, she thought, was potentially well-placed to exert uh, top-down uh, control, uh, but at least was worthy of uh, testing to see if it had a physiological effect on, uh, on, a, on any uh, measure of activity or, or, or function. Now, this, of course, would have been very difficult to do if you think about this. How could you exert control over a pathway like this defined by origin and target without uh, interfering with uh, other pathways? And this uh, was exactly an example of something well suited to optogenetic uh, methods. And what we've, you know, uh, described, and what we and many other studies have found, this is a, a summary that you uh, don't have to read, but many st uh, studies exerting control over different projection origins and targets, turning up or down those projections and looking at controls, uh, behavioral effects uh, that, that are seen. This is all uh, widely uh, uh, done around the world. What we often do is we'll introduce a uh, virus carrying a light-activated regulator of ion flow, a microbial opsin, into a defined brain region, and we can bring in a fiber optic and deliver light to that brain region, or we can put the fiber optic somewhere else, and that will recruit cells defined by having a particular connectivity pattern because the protein will fill the cell, and cells that may have that projection among their other projections will be recruited in that way by type. And of course, uh, since uh, uh, the introduction uh, uh, was quite clear, uh, I won't have to spend much time on this, but it's uh, a good opportunity to point out one very important thing, uh, 
and it's a broader point, I think, for uh, science and society in general, is that these uh, microbial opsins, these single protein light activated regulators of ion flow, like this channel red opsin, which is a blue light activated cation channel that uh, we borrowed from this Chlamydomonas reinhardii single celled green algae, or this halo red opsin, a uh, yellow or amber light recruited uh, chloride pump, which can be used to inhibit, and that is derived from an archaeobacterium. These uh, were studied for uh, decades, uh, beginning back in 1971 uh, uh, in work uh, that uh, Dieter Osterfeldt led. And uh, these single gene and the single uh, componency of these were crucial in allowing uh, optogenetics to actually work to be uh, efficient. But these were people who were not applying their work uh, to certainly psychiatry or neuroscience, they were pure basic biophysicists and membrane uh, uh, biologists. Uh, and, uh, Dieter Osterheld, particularly for identifying bacteria at Opsin, the first member of this family, uh, Matsuni Yagi and Mukahara for identifying the chloride uh, pumps, and uh, followed by Janos Lani in uh, between 1977 and the 80s, and Peter Hegemann for his identification of the uh, channel at Opsin cation channel. And so it's an important story in uh, understanding the importance of pure basic science, uh, uh, which uh, may not have a clear uh, application at first. But what we found over about five years between 2004 and 2009 is you could start to make this actually work in a practical uh, sense. You could flash blue light and drive action potentials in cells expressing this channel rhodopsin in culture or eventually uh, in behaving animals using a fiber optic delivering light and gene targeting strategies to get particular cells to express the opsins. And we and many others have now, uh, as uh, Marie summarized, uh, have been using this approach to identify the cellular activity patterns that do control behavior, whether in, in uh, adaptive or maladaptive states. But this is exactly what is well suited for this specific example as well. And what Priya then did was she introduced the opsin gene uh, into anterior cingulate cortex using a different kind of virus. This is an adeno-associated viral vector that does not transduce axon terminals efficiently, but does transduce the local cell bodies. And she used this to produce either just a yellow fluorescent protein to look at the anatomy or a uh, channel rhodopsin uh, to exert control over that projection. And what she found, first of all, even with just a yellow fluorescent protein, was she could see uh, after injecting the anterior cingulate and imaging in dorsal hippocampus, she could see quite clearly the local fibers uh, investing the CA3 uh, and CA1 pyramidal cell. Uh, layers. Uh, blue here is DAPI for the cells, uh, uh, cell nuclei, and uh, green is the, is the fibers investing the local cells. Uh, the dentate gyrus had essentially no labeling, so this appeared to be an anterior cingulate to CA subfield specific projection, and so we called it for shorthand the ACCA uh, projection. But this is anatomy, which is uh, fundamental, uh, extremely important, and the source of uh, the future knowledge, but requiring more uh, to validate the uh, functionality. And optogenetics also uh, uh, allows a, a very precise way of uh, approaching this question as well, because from that very same preparation, one can then uh, cut an acute brain slice from the hippocampus. The uh, persisting uh, axonal fibers that are still present uh, continue to function as, as they do in acute slices in general. And you can carry out patch clamp recording onto uh, different subfields of this uh, structure and flash blue light on your microscope and uh, test for the presence of acute, uh, uh, in this acute slice of direct monosynaptic connectivity. And she saw robust uh, actuation, uh, uh, EPSCs elicited by light uh, and whole cell patch clamp in the CA1 and CA3 subfields. Uh, absolutely nothing was detectable uh, in her hands in the dentate gyrus, uh, consistent with the anatomy. And how big were these? Well, there was a range. That was interesting. There was a wide range in the magnitude of these uh, events, uh, but uh, uh, clearly capable of driving spiking, even by themselves, uh, in the uh, postsynaptic cells. And so these projections appear to be potent or exist over a dynamic uh, range, which includes uh, a potent uh, uh, control of spiking. Now, that's an acute slice, so what happens in behaving animals? And here, again, we can uh, test this uh, question using the optogenetic uh, methods. And here, uh, she carried out uh, uh, another experiment. She introduced the channel rhodopsin by rabies virus into dorsal uh, hippocampus. And 
Remember, rabies will transduce axon terminals. This is a short-term experiment. The whole thing lasted only three days. In the long term, a rabies virus carrying a channel rhodopsin will be toxic to cells, but in the short term, uh, it's, it's perfectly fine for this sort of experiment. And she could deliver then blue light to anterior cingulate, recruiting cells, which had cell bodies there, by virtue of having, among their projections, connectivity to the uh, dorsal hippocampal CA subfields. And she did a contextual uh, memory task uh, that was uh, quite simple uh, and straightforward uh, in a context uh, that uh, is recognizable to the animal. Uh, mild foot shock is delivered. Uh, this is called fear conditioning, or FC. There were also animals that did not get a shock uh, and animals that did get a shock but just had yellow fluorescent protein instead of a channel rhodopsin present. And then on the second day, she puts the animals in a different context. And the readout here is a behavioral readout. It's one of freezing. The animal will freeze, typically, if you were to put it back in the initial context where it received the shock, and this is a hippocampus-dependent uh, behavior, uh, classically. However, uh, in a different context, that would not uh, occur. And indeed, when she put the animals on the second day into the second context, there was no freezing. But then when she drove this projection, there was a marked uh, freezing uh, response that uh, persisted and then uh, decayed and could be uh, reintroduced. And this did not occur uh, in mice that expressed just a yellow fluorescent protein, so it wasn't a nonspecific effect of the light uh, control we always uh, make sure to do. But also, uh, this only occurred in animals that had been fear conditioned, uh, so only animals that had had this recent strong uh, salient uh, behavioral uh, intervention. And this was uh, striking enough that she wanted to follow this up with a more detailed study, a longer-term study, bringing more classical tools, tools from behavioral uh, neuroscience to bear, including testing the extinction and reinstatement of the memory. Now, with the rabies virus, the experiment is too short-term to allow that, but there are other strategies that we have uh, available to us. The adenosociated viral vectors can be used to express uh, microbial opsins at uh, high levels for a long period of time without toxicity. And so she did the experiment of introducing by an associated viral vector uh, the channel rhodopsin YFP uh, fusion protein uh, uh, carried by the uh, gene in the an associated viral vector into anterior cingulate and then uh, delivered light uh, to the dorsal hippocampus recruiting cells defined by having this projection. And here she was able to carry out a much longer experiment and she saw, first of all, the same thing, no freezing in the second context, uh, prominent uh, freezing though driven by uh, uh, control uh, excitation of that projection, uh, followed by decay and uh, reapplication. Now, you can carry out an extinction process by repeatedly exposing the animal to the original shock paired context, but without delivering shock, and the fear memory uh, goes away. And that is also observed here. The uh, uh, light uh, elicitation of the freezing behavior uh, uh, disappeared as well. But it could be reinstated. And again, these behaviors were uh, not seen in the yellow fluorescent protein expressing uh, animals. Now, you could ask, as we naturally did, perhaps this is a nonspecific effect of uh, driving the hippocampus, uh, and this uh, might happen. Uh, yes, it only happens in the fear conditioned animals, but perhaps that, that's put them into a sensitized state, and a little bit of additional drive of the hippocampus is enough to, to cause a freezing behavior. And so we did a number of tests to address this. And it seems uh, to not be the case. Uh, different kinds of uh, direct or indirect drive of the hippocampus did not elicit this freezing response. Uh, the prominent uh, medial septum input to uh, hippocampus did not elicit a detectable uh, freezing response comparable to what was seen before, nor did even direct excitation of uh, the hippocampus itself. Uh, and this not particularly surprising. The hippocampus itself is not uh, classically associated with uh, a directly driven uh, actuation causing a fear response, unlike other structures like the basolateral uh, amygdala, uh, but it was still uh, an important experiment uh, to be done. So there appeared to be something uh, uh, specific uh, uh, and relevant about this uh, projection. And she then asked the question, could you inhibit this projection and uh, reduce uh, uh, naturally uh, uh, created or endogenously present uh, fewer memories. And here she did an experiment introducing another kind of retrograde virus like the rabies. This is called a CAV virus that delivered a protein called Cre recombinase. Cre recombinase is a DNA modifying agent and what is delivered into prefrontal cortex is a virus that needs that DNA modifying agent in order to function. It's a broken virus. 
that expresses the inhibitory microbial opsin, uh, haloid opsin, and PHR. And this would exert an inhibitory effect, but this virus is broken by this uh, specifically introduced uh, recombinase-dependent uh, uh, mixing up of the sequence that can be fixed by Cree, though. And so Cree is delivered into these cells that have this projection, and, and Cree will fix those prefrontal cells that have this uh, projection. So you can see the, the, the beautiful complexity of the different viral and the genetic tools that we can bring uh, to bear in this sort of situation. And she was able to show that inhibiting those cells that have this uh, projection did inhibit the uh, a, a freezing response that was induced by the uh, contextual fear conditioning. And this was not seen in a uh, non-hippocampus dependent task, a single uh, Q-dependent uh, uh, freezing response. And so it depended on cells that had this projection and was itself hippocampus dependent. Now, this uh, told us a lot about this projection. Uh, it was quite interesting, but uh, Priya wanted to know more, and specifically, she wanted to know what is going on in the hippocampus while this is happening. And so she wanted to go in and actually image the activity of these cells during behavior and during control via this top-down projection. And this was a challenge, but uh, she got there. And the way we did it was the following. We uh, set up a head fixed. So the animal's head is fixed, but it still uh, can move uh, because we've got a virtual reality environment that we can provide for it. And there's a spinning ball. This is largely based on an interesting preparation developed in David Tank's lab a number of years ago with some modifications for this specific experiment. And we can prevent, uh, we, we can uh, provide a context to the animal that has somatosensory and olfactory uh, and acoustic uh, cues, auditory cues, uh, as well as uh, visual cues. And we can deliver uh, the mild shocks and elicit uh, uh, con context-dependent uh, freezing responses. But in this case, the most uh, reliable way of assessing that freezing response is uh, through lick suppression. So the animal has a, a lick port where it's uh, uh, ingesting water by licks, and you can track that, uh, which is, car which is uh, shown here in these blue dashes. But when the animal that has been fear-conditioned uh, sees in the virtual reality that it's in the fear-associated context, there's a prominent reduction in the lick rate. So this is lick suppression, uh, well studied both in our hands and in the hands of others to be a, a reliable uh, way of assessing this uh, context-dependent uh, freezing-related response. And the first question was, does this uh, you know, work at all in this uh, setting, in this head-fixed setting? An important uh, validation uh, needed to be carried out. And indeed, she saw that there was no difference between the fear and neutral context in the uh, lick rate uh, prior to training. During training, there started to be a difference. And then uh, the following day, during retrieval of the memory presentation of the context, there was a prominent lick suppression that uh, persisted for a long time. So this was indeed the sort of uh, uh, context-dependent uh, learning that uh, was uh, important to make sure we had present in, the, uh, in this particular task. So then, um, this reason for going head fixed was then we could bring in uh, a, a very um, high resolution and fast uh, 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 cellular scale imaging of uh, local neural activity uh, during these behaviors. And here uh, we're capitalizing on uh, uh, rapid development of genetically encoded calcium indicators taking place around the world. There are prominent groups in Japan and Canada and Virginia that are developing light activated uh, that are uh, calcium-activated uh, reporters of neural activity, reporters of altered calcium concentration in cells, and they report this with altered uh, fluorescence uh, uh, properties. And these are, uh, in this particular case, we're using the GCAMP uh, 6M, which reports on intracellular calcium, uh, a marker of neural activity. And you can see expression of the GCAMP 6M in the uh, CA3 uh, cells here in the hippocampus, uh, bordering on CA2. And you can see the, the uh, power of this preparation. We can come in with our uh, imaging, uh, and uh, there's an area of uh, cortex that has to be cleared away above this. Uh, and so that's, of course, an uh, important consideration where you have to make sure that the animals are, are healthy and exhibit normal baseline uh, behaviors. Uh, so we have, uh, 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 we take great care with that. And, uh, but the, uh, at the end of the day, what you can do is bring in your optics and observe, as I'll show you here, this cellular resolution activity, even during uh, uh, this head-fixed behavior and context-dependent memory uh, recall. So this was the preparation, and how many neurons can you see? Well, uh, with 
Uh, you can see nearly 100 with a single plane and with a fast resonance scanning two photon, you can look in uh, several different uh, planes. And so on a single field of view, a single animal, we can see up to uh, 400 neurons or more. And right away, uh, we saw some interesting things. First question is, uh, even uh, separate from exertion of top-down control, what's naturally happening during uh, the fear uh, conditioning and recall. And Priya noticed a prominent uh, effect on the uh, correlation structure in the activity of cells that uh, was present. Uh, in the, before uh, exposure to con before exposure to training, the fear, what would become the fear context or the neutral context showed similar correlation structure of activity patterns in the cells. Uh, what's plotted on the x-axis is the number of correlated pairs. So for each cell, you look at the uh, number of other neurons that were synchronous in their firing uh, over the window of the experiment with the particular cell that you're looking at. And you take that number and you bin it in this histogram and the number of cells that show a particular number of correlations is plotted. So it's a simple histogram and you can see there's a, a particular kind of distribution not particularly skewed. Uh, that all changes though in a very reliable fashion as Priya found uh, with uh, fear conditioning. This distribution starts to change during training on day th three retrieval. This is the same animal. If the animal's in the neutral context, you still see that uh, uh, distribution uh, uh, appearing similar. But when that same animal is in the fear context, there's a marked shift. There's a, a decorrelation of some neurons and the appearance of a new, uh, high, more highly correlated population. We call these uh, hub neurons or highly correlated neurons. So this was a, a, a very interesting finding. and It was very consistent uh, from animal to animal. Uh, here are five separate animals where this change in correlation structure is seen. And so the right way to look at this is comparing top and down for each animal. Uh, and you can see the neutral context on the bottom and the fear context on the top. And you can see that consistent change in the distribution. We looked at a lot of different ways of uh, uh, statistically understanding and representing this uh, effect of looking at clustering uh, coefficients and uh, uh, power laws and, uh, and path lengths and uh, graph theory terminology. But what was by far the most predictive of, of all these measures uh, was the uh, power law uh, exponent describing this. And, and that separated the fear in the neutral context by far most reliably uh, c compared to any other statistical measure. So there's a change in this uh, distribution that's uh, uh, associated with a, 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 a hierarchical uh, network. And there was another interesting feature about this population of cells. Not only did the ones that uh, their, had their activity appear in this context, not only were they uh, extraordinarily highly connected uh, in terms of functional activity, there's no anatomy, but we see these high correlations, but they showed interesting temporal properties. Uh, they tended to lead to appear early or lead synchronous population-wide events. And so you can see the value of having multiple single cell resolution across these volumes. If you just uh, report on the percent of cells active as a function of time, you see uh, occasional uh, uh, bursts of activity. Uh, we call these synchronous events that occur above uh, uh, the statistical background. And when these occur, the uh, hub cells tend to be present early in or leading those uh, uh, events. And this is summarized here in a cumulative uh, probability uh, 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 histogram. We don't know what those synchronous events uh, are. They don't appear to be representing uh, what people in uh, the field have speculated might be attractor dynamics, the, uh, 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 the gradual uh, attraction to a particular uh, state defined by a stable pattern of neural activity. But uh, what is clear is that in the fear context, there are more of those synchronous events and they're not associated with uh, measures like velocity or, or lick rate. And so it appears to be a uh, perhaps an internally generated uh, mechanism of exploring the network state space. Whatever those are doing, uh, the highly connected cells that appear in the fear context uh, tend to be leading those events. Final set of questions then was, uh, these are interestingly placed. They're, they appear, this network uh, in the fear context appears to have this uh, a power law structure of a uh, suggestive of a hierarchical network. Uh, if there is any connection with this top-down projection, that might explain how this relatively sparse a uh, cortical projection might, under some circumstances, uh, be able to exert a, a relatively potent effect on um, memory. And here, 
uh, to address this question, we needed to exert uh, control and image at the same time. Now, uh, G-Camps and Channel Robson are both excited by blue light, and this created the need uh, to uh, have a, one of those be red shifted. And what um, Priya did was make use of a derivative of a microbial opsin that uh, Feng Zhang had found in the lab uh, back in 2008, and that was modified and optimized later by uh, Ofer Yizar and others, and that was work in collaboration with uh, Peter Hegemon. And this Volvox uh, carteri, it's a multicellular green algae, channel opsin we call VCHR1. It's red shifted, and you can excite it in the amber. And uh, over a number of years, we engineered it to have higher photocurrents, uh, more than a tenfold improvement, and the resulting tool is called uh, C1V1. Now, this is a red light activated excitatory channel rhodopsin. It's since found a number of interesting applications. For example, it responds very well to two photon illumination, and so you can exert single cell control using that uh, low scattering and uh, spatially precise properties of two photon microscopy to control single cells. But because of its red shifted uh, spectrum, it's particularly suited for combination with calcium imaging, as we and others have found. This is an experiment done by Jim Marshall in my laboratory, uh, looking at cells in the visual cortex of an awake uh, mouse, hopping from cell to cell with his stimulation to drive the C1V1 opsin. And these cells are also expressing a G-camp, and he can look at cell number indexed here over time, and the intensity of the color scale shows how strongly the neurons are responding. And in this awake mouse, you can uh, ping individual cells and look at their responses and the network responses. And we and others, including in this collaboration with David Tank, have used this method to look at the multiple single cell populations that are uh, present uh, during uh, complex behaviors. You can also do this at the population level with a fiber optic instead of the single uh, cell level. So this tool, or in this case, a derivative thereof, a opsin uh, that we call uh, breaches that uses a number of different elements of these initial Volvox channel red opsins. It then went through a stage of optimization in our uh, colleague Roger Chen's lab, and then back in our lab, uh, Andre Berndt carried out a number of additional modifications, which I won't dwell on here. The bottom line is this is a fast red light activated opsin that goes very well down axon terminals as indicated here in red, and so we end up with this sort of preparation where we can have the uh, G-CAMP expressing hippocampal neurons reporting on their activity by the G-CAMP. We have uh, the red, as shown in red here, a, a red light activated uh, opsin, and we can observe uh, the activity uh, uh, during control uh, or not in this animal. So as you can imagine, this is a, a very exciting uh, preparation, and uh, we were intrigued to, to look at what uh, might happen. Now, this movie uh, is an example of that. We're going to be exerting control of this uh, top-down projection optically, and the asterisk that comes on here uh, will indicate when that stimulation is started. The red circles are simply areas uh, to help guide your attention to uh, where there's not much going on initially. After the stimulation, you will see some things happening, but it, you'll, you can pay attention also that, to noticing that there's a variability in, in latency. It's not as if all of these uh, new cells come on at once. So there's the stimulation. You can see some of them appearing. And I'll play it again so you can take another look. Um, the Appearance of some of the new cells at variable latency is something that's uh, of interest because it's not clear uh, at first blush why uh, the cells would have variable latency and what their roles are. Uh, we certainly don't know a causal role of these cells, but now we can see there's a population that is uh, causally recruited by this top-down projection. And so a key question became, uh, what are these cells and is there any relationship to the highly connected cells? To address this question, uh, are these hub neurons or highly connected neurons uh, or highly correlated neurons, are they being driven uh, in any kind of selective way by this top-down projection? This was a difficult experiment to do because we had to observe the same cells uh, over before, during, and after training over many days, and that means we have to go back and be able to find the same field of cells in the same animal, uh, but we can do that and even at different of those optical slices uh, across the preparation, and we can find the same fields and the same cells uh, over many days before and after training. 
And so the question became, uh, can we, what happens? Uh, first of all, uh, do we get this top-down uh, drive, first of all, of the behavior, similar to what we saw in the freely moving case with the freezing behavior? And that experiment is shown here, uh, looking before training and after training in this head-fixed lick suppression uh, task. And in the neutral context, there's no uh, lick suppression, either before or after training. Uh, but in the fear-conditioned animals, there is a prominent lick suppression, uh, consistent uh, with what I showed you before, showing the uh, context-dependent ret retrieval of the fear memory. But in the neutral context, uh, before training, even when you stimulate uh, uh, this projection, you don't see the freezing response. But uh, in the fear-conditioned animals, neutral context corresponding to the context B in the freely moving case, you do see uh, lick suppression. So this, in the head fix case, all seems to be operating just as it did in the, in the freely moving uh, case. So then we were very interested to know what's happening uh, to these uh, highly uh, correlated or hub neurons and, in general, the population responses. And we saw a couple very interesting things. This is the uh, last data slide on this project, but it showed uh, some, some uh, responses that really piqued our interest. First of all, looking at that latency that I drew your attention to earlier, before fear conditioning, uh, after driving of this top-down projection, as I showed you, there's a variable uh, latency of uh, local responses. But after fear conditioning, uh, those responses tend to become uh, more uh, synchronous and uh, uh, appearance of a shorter latency population uh, is clear. And that was a consistent finding. We have a shift toward these uh, more highly uh, uh, precise and short latency responses. So that was one finding. The other uh, uh, quite interesting finding was that there did appear to be a selective relationship between this top-down projection and the hub. Uh, neurons. If you look at the fraction of different populations of cells that were recruited during this optical top-down uh, stimulation uh, before and after training, the neutral context uh, uh, highly uh, correlated cells or hub cells did not change in the fraction that were recruited by the uh, uh, stimulation, nor did the non-hub cells or non-highly connected cells change in the neutral context. Even in the fear context, the non hub neurons didn't appear to change in terms of the fraction that was recruited, but there was a, a prominent change in, rec in recruitment of the a hub or highly correlated neurons in the fear context by the top-down projection. So we do think there is a, a special relationship between this uh, anterior cingulate to CA projection that it uh, influences these uh, uh, highly correlated hub neurons, which tend to lead these synchronous events and exert uh, potent control over uh, behavior. Now, uh, this for us was uh, interesting because uh, uh, an unbiased uh, exploration had a, uh, uh, it led to a, a novel and surprising result, uh, and it has some interesting implications for the uh, uh, process of memory. If in a highly salient uh, behavioral experience that a, a, a population of cells in prefrontal cortex is uh, co-involved with the uh, uh, memory trace uh, placement, that provides an additional route to memory uh, recruitment that could be of value in uh, the setting of an extremely salient uh, behavioral experience. And of course, there's much more we'd like to explore about this. It has interesting implications uh, for uh, uh, memory, uh, but also for uh, mood regulation and, and uh, therapeutics. So that was one uh, a story that was of interest. Uh, a couple other shorter things I want to share with you in uh, one more historical interlude uh, following up on the, the 10th year anniversary aspect that uh, uh, Marie mentioned. Uh, and here I, I like to uh, highlight again some of the, the, the pioneers and, and also the, the depth of the uh, microbial opsin uh, literature. In fact, it was very rich uh, textbook knowledge. This was uh, Lubert Stryer's beautiful uh, biochemistry textbook. Uh, uh, this is the 1988 version. This was actually my uh, version uh, now almost 30 years ago. Uh, and you can see there is the uh, bacterial rhodopsin photocycle uh, clearly described. And you might ask, this is uh, interesting, uh, of course, so well characterized over so long. Uh, why did it take time uh, to uh, develop in, uh, this method? And the editors of uh, Nature and Neuroscience asked me to do a couple things. They asked me to, to make a, a timeline of uh, publications uh, using optogenetics as a function of time. And so I, I did that, and that's shown here in this uh, uh, blue uh, square trace. But I added in another thing that they didn't ask for. This is the uh, 
bacteria rhodopsin literature. And you can see, starting from uh, Osterfeld and Stachinius' first paper in 1971, uh, over 5,000 papers over the years, an incredibly uh, elegant and important uh, body uh, of work. The other interesting uh, feature of this, though, is, of course, uh, the, uh, uh, the first uh, five years after uh, the uh, initial uh, uh, paper uh, describing uh, microbial opsin introduction to neurons, not a lot happened in terms of uh, publications. It actually took a number of years to sort out a number of the kinks and really make optogenetics a practicable uh, and workable and versatile uh, 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 tool. And the other thing they asked me to do was show uh, the notebook page from the very first actuation of neurons with channelrodopsin, and so I showed that here. This is my... Uh, Psychiatrist scrawl, uh, uh, perhaps difficult to read, but uh, this was part of a broader vision in the laboratory of uh, I was trying to d introduce different activity regulation tools. And so you can see what I'm doing here is uh, this is uh, July 1st, 2004. I'm introducing different uh, opsin, uh, well, one opsin uh, construct, but also different channels. And so I had uh, wild type and dominant negative. Uh, task channels, potassium channels that I was going to introduce by retroviral or lentiviral methods to turn up or down activity. Uh, but one of those conditions was uh, indeed the, the channel rhodopsin experiment, and I, the, 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 the very uh, uh, humble, you could even say uh, overly simple nature of this experiment was uh, interesting to place in the uh, bigger context, but I did uh, carry out a stimulation of these uh, neurons that I'd uh, introduced the gene into, and uh, the readout of membrane actuation and, and uh, neuron activation was the uh, phosphorylation of the transcription factor, uh, Krebs ser serine 133 phosphorylation. And I saw more of those activated cells in the stimulated than in the unstimulated case. It was just barely a hint of uh, something. It was significant, but it was enough uh, to get over that uh, immense energy barrier of wondering, are these very evolutionarily distant uh, proteins going to function in mammalian neurons? Are, gonna, are they going to be targeted to the membrane and not toxic in these cells? Will they allow a light actuation of the neurons? And Sometimes the little bit of uh, a hint that something will work uh, uh, can mean a great deal. And then, of course, uh, uh, a lot of work rapidly followed after that. Uh, here you can see uh, uh, drawings and recordings uh, uh, from the students, Fung and Ed, in the laboratory. Uh, you, this is actually a drawing Fung did. He's quite a talented uh, artist as well. But this was his initial schematic of the fiber optic interface, and this is a later actual instantiation of that carried out by Inbal uh, Goshen in the lab. And you can, this was uh, years later, but you can actually see uh, uh, the real life actually imitating the initial uh, art in some way. But that took a number of years to sort out all those details and get it to work. And that underscores this other uh, feature of this plot, that four or five years of delay before those uh, 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 papers that Marie summarized uh, started to come out. And uh, again, it's, a, I think, a point worth making that the, the, the humbleness of initial experiments and, and little hints of something can mean a, a lot later. The other uh, interesting thing is to place this in the context of the modern meth the methods that we have. Things have gone very quickly in those uh, 11 years, but uh, there's still uh, immense opportunities for development. And I wanted to touch on uh, a couple other, in a much uh, shorter way, a couple other recent stories that are uh, coming out that uh, use this uh, same sort of combination of methods, anatomy and observation and control, all integrated in the same preparation at the same time. The top-down control of memory, that was uh, um, something that uh, Priya had been working on, on the same, at the same time. Avishek Adhikari in the laboratory was interested in a different kind of top-down control, top-down control of anxiety and fear. And we had, in prior work, done a lot of subcortical investigations of the neural populations and circuit elements that uh, recruit fear and anxiety responses and indeed particular features of ang anxious states. For example, Sung Yon Kim in the laboratory led an experiment where he introduced a channel rhodopsin into the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis and delivered light to different outgoing projections. And he found that different outgoing projections recruited different features of the anxious state. Uh, as, as we know, anxiety is uh, complex. It has respiratory rate changes. It has heart rate changes. It has behavioral risk avoidance changes. It has a negative subjective valence, which is very clinically important. And 
these somehow have to be all uh, assembled when anxiety starts and then disassembled together in coordinate fashion. And what Sung-Yeon Kim had found, and this was in collaboration with Abhishek in 2013, was that a projection from the BNST to the parabrachial nucleus appeared to recruit the respiratory rate change. A projection to the lateral hypothalamus appeared to recruit the risk avoidance change as assessed on the elevated plus maze. And a different projection to the ventral tegmental area appeared to underlie the uh, valence of the state, uh, the aversive or repetitive nature of the state as assessed by the animal's condition to place preference. And some of those data are shown here to show you the nature of the result. For example, the projection from the an uh, anterodorsal uh, BNST to lateral hypothalamus gave rise to a reversible amount of time spent in the open arm, the exposed arm of the elevated plus maze. And that's, so that's an anxiolytic type response for a rodent to spend more time in the open arm. But there was no respiratory rate change that was caused by that particular control. In contrast, the projection from the BNST to the parabrachial nucleus did not affect the risk avoidance, but did elicit that respiratory rate change. And then finally, the projection to the ventral tegmental area, where dopamine neurons, among other neurons, reside. Uh, there was no change in the behavioral risk avoidance. There was no detectable change in the respiratory rate, but there was a prominent uh, appetitive quality uh, to this uh, state assessed by the uh, real-time place preference where the animal spends more time in the chamber where it gets the stimulation. And so each uh, projection from the BNSTs uh, appeared to have the property of, uh, of recruiting a different feature of the state, and we found recurrent circuitry in the BNST that might help coordinate the state. Now that was the situation of, of what we had done in 2013. That's all subcortical. But the same sort of interesting questions arise about top-down control. For example, in PTSD, uh, severe PTSD, a major in, uh, uh, in some areas of the world, and, and, uh, including in the U.S., increasing uh, problem is uh, the difficulty of treating PTSD. It's not very responsive to medications, which are either ineffective or uh, cause uh, a great deal of uh, sedation, uh, cognitive changes, and uh, addictive uh, uh, risk. And what is often very effective, though, is uh, uh, cognitive uh, therapies again. So we know there, there is some sort of top-down control where thoughts can be used to regulate these uh, subcortical uh, uh, responses. And the, sort of, the textbook level understanding of this, uh, and this uh, was to some extent supported by the data, but to other extents not, more or less looked like this, that there was a uh, amygdala-centered uh, 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 fear uh, uh, and anxiety regulation region that include, included the extended amygdala, inclu including the BNST, uh, in which uh, drive of the central nuclei of the amygdala uh, elicits uh, uh, fear responses and, and also separately of anxiety-related responses. Now, it was known by putting electrodes into different areas of prefrontal cortex that driving the prelimbic cortex appeared to promote fear responses, and putting an electrode in, into infralimbic appeared to inhibit fear responses. But the mechanism of that was not known. I've shown what, is show, what has shown up in, in, uh, in papers and textbooks, but the actuality is this uh, connection was not known to exist, but it was a tempting possibility because there are in the amygdala, these clusters of GABAergic inhibitory neurons at the intercalated cell clusters, or ITCs, and the central lateral nucleus of the amygdala that, it could, that it, by connectivity and also other studies appear to exert an inhibitory effect on this output structure uh, of the amygdala. So if there were such a top-down control pathway, that would be very appealing. In fact, most people, including myself, thought that was present, and so that was Avi Shek's initial uh, mission to go in and find that uh, projection and see if it's indeed doing what we thought. And we encountered a very big surprise. So the first uh, way that we got there was uh, to take a look at the uh, anatomy. In this case, we didn't use a rabies method. We used uh, the brain transparency method uh, called clarity. And this uh, is illustrated here. This is a mouse brain that's been made transparent. The green label is uh, yellow fluorescent protein in long-range uh, projection fibers. and uh, this uh, works by reducing scattering, uh, and we reduce scattering by removing lipid aqueous interfaces, and we do that by removing uh, the lipids and the fats without causing uh, uh, total destruction. But this cannot be done uh, in the live case. Uh, this is uh, 
uh, an example of how hard it can be to make the central nervous system transparent. Many animals have gone to great length to uh, achieve that, but the central nervous system doesn't quite yield because the problem is no longer absorption. It's, uh, it is scattering and it's hard to uh, extricate this fundamental nature of jumbled up uh, lipid aqueous interfaces from the presence of a central nervous system. But you can do this after life. And this is a mouse brain before and after the clarity process. You can read uh, this quote from Ramoni Cajal through the uh, brain, which by itself is not that useful, but you can actually do some useful things. And the, the way this works, I'll, I'll, I'll mention this quite briefly, uh, is the lipid removal, but to make that work with a strong ionic detergent, SDS, which would otherwise be destructive, is to build in place a acrylamide-based composite, a gel covalently linked with native amine-containing biomolecules, and those get locked in place in this nanoporous network, and then you can very robustly remove the lipids. In our first paper in 2013, we were very interested in speed, and so we imposed electric fields and forced out the lipids quite quickly. And that worked uh, over a matter of a couple days for a rodent brain. We since uh, simplified the process in a Nature Protocols uh, paper. And actually the first, uh, we call this uh, passive clarity, where you can simply rock the uh, tissue and it takes a couple weeks. You still build the hydrogel in advance, but uh, this is much simpler. And actually the first published use of that is a, a collaboration with Thomas Hookfeldt's lab uh, in PNAS, uh, uh, looking at the, uh, the NECAB uh, interneuron population. This, though, still left an enormous uh, a question, which is how do you image the resulting population? And this is a challenge that is summarized here. The tissue is transparent, so you can use confocal and look through an entire mouse brain without uh, sufficient signal uh, degradation. Uh, and leading microscope manufacturers, Olympus and uh, Zeiss uh, and Leica, have now come out with clarity-optimized uh, objectives, so that's all good. But You've got a bleaching problem because you're moving your uh, pinhole and uh, the entire tissue is being uh, illuminated while you're doing this. And if you want high resolution information across your whole volume, it's going to take a very long time. Now, light sheet microscopy, as we found recently, seems to address this problem uh, with some optimizations. You can scan a, a plane of light through tissue and capitalize on these fast uh, scientific grade CMOS cameras. And I'll just show an example of this without getting into the science of this paper. This is Talia Lerner's paper, but this is a brain-wide map with clarity and clarity optimized light sheet microscopy of all the neurons that project to the substantia nigra pars compacted dopamine neurons that themselves in turn project to dorsolateral striatum. So this is a, a highly specified population of cells, but it's global, brain-wide. It's all the cells that project to this population that project to this other place. And uh, this is done with a, a combination of, in, of interesting uh, rabies methods, clarity, and, and the light sheet microscopy. I'm showing it here just to show you the essence of the uh, clarity method uh, rather than go into details. But this was something that we could then begin to take advantage of uh, for this question of top-down control in the amygdala. So this was uh, Talia's uh, paper in cell, but I won't dwell on that. I'm going to get right back to uh, Avi's paper. And so the first question we had is, let's go in and find this uh, pathway, and then we'll know where to go and, and exert control. And so we labeled in green, uh, in this case with a channel rhodopsin injection here, and we went to look here to see where the projections were. And here's where we got our big surprise. And so this is a clarity movie, uh, and the top-down projections are shown in green. This is an animal where the intercalated cells that everybody thought, we thought were going to be the targets, are shown in red. And what we found in having the intactness of the volume and being able to turn it every which way and look in and around was remarkable. There was actually an avoidance of the intercalated cell clusters by this top-down projection. And no matter how many animals we looked at, and we looked in rats and mice, this was consistent finding. There are uh, some tendrils there. It's not that there's uh, absolutely nothing, but this certainly didn't look to us as though this was uh, going to be the dominant top-down control pathway given this apparent avoidance of the intercalated cell clusters. So uh, this was the first uh, uh, look at this, and we said, well, we've got to now, guided by that, that uh, look, uh, let's go in and, and do a number of other tests and, and see what's really going on. So we did an optogenetic experiment driving the projections from ventromedial prefrontal cortex, uh, driving those projections in amygdala, and we saw no CFOS elevation, immediate early gene activation in BLA, but we saw a prominent uh, 
CFOS actuation in this other structure, very uh, much understudied, not well known, the BMA, basomedial amygdala. And this was a, a surprise, uh, but it was consistent uh, across animals that we did not see activation of uh, uh, the intercalated cells or the basolateral amygdala with this top-down drive, but prominent activation in the BMA. And verifying that projection, we did a rabies injection, which you're now familiar with, into the BMA, and we could see, indeed, the cell bodies giving rise to that projection show this nice uh, pocket in the ventral uh, prefrontal cortex and not the dorsal. So we had to follow that up to show it was functionally present, and we did a lot of patch clamping. Actually, Talia Lerner did these experiments and patched uh, many of these cells, patched many of these intercalated cells while driving in acute slice this top-down uh, uh, projection and never saw a direct monosynaptic response. The open symbols here show cases where there was uh, no response. Uh, she did find one of many cells in the BLA that did have that response, but by far the dominant responders were in the basomedial amygdala, indeed. And then finally, uh, the behavioral experiment shown here, uh, introducing in the BMA by this retrograde virus, the cav cre virus, and then the CRE-dependent virus in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and driving cells that have that projection, and looking at this uh, conditioned fear response. And here you can see this uh, cued freezing behavior uh, that is turned on in both the yellow fluorescent protein and the channel rhodopsin populations. And then this extinction, driving cells that have this projection with blue light, no change in YFP, but cells with the channel rhodopsin, a prominent reduction uh, in the freezing response, and that indeed turned into an extinction, a memory that lasted for at least a day afterward. So this is a behaviorally significant pathway. It's activated and not previously appreciated, and we think this may be a, a, a prominent top-down uh, mechanism for uh, uh, fear control. And there's also uh, anxiety work as well in this, in this paper. So uh, this is the, uh, the, the main uh, data I wanted to share with you. Of course, in many ways, uh, you know, there's, uh, as Marie mentioned, uh, 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 a lot of work going on in many different uh, uh, realms across the, the brain. Uh, you know, it's an active area of research and we have a long way to go, but you might imagine uh, looking back, those initial uh, two uh, bodies of work almost 200 years ago, certain uh, appeal and beginning to weave together these two long uh, 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 threads of research that have been uh, uh, present for a long time. The final little bit of, of data to show you before I wrap up just a couple minutes is to give you a hint in my uh, background uh, before I became a patch clamper was very deep in electrophysiology, but also in uh, biochemistry, and I was trained in, uh, uh, at, uh, in biochemistry and molecular biology, including by structural biologists, and so I have a deep uh, appreciation for these beautiful proteins themselves, and they're interesting in themselves, even separate from optogenetics, and we've been very lucky to be able to delve into their operation uh, in, in a uh, a, a very satisfying way. First question was, what is the structure of channel rhodopsin? It's a seven transmembrane protein, uh, but if it had a channel property, that was not clear how that would work, and so we wanted to get to a crystal structure. And this was difficult. It took a long time. Uh, we made hundreds of different uh, uh, constructs and working with our uh, collaborator, Osamu Nareki, at the University of Tokyo. Finally, in 2012, we got to the crystal structure of channel rhodopsin. And it's a dimer of two seven transmembrane proteins. Each one has its own pore, and there's an all-trans retinal uh, chromophore, as shown here in magenta. And we could see the pore. It was a closed state structure, but we could see it was lined with uh, residues that were negative or polar, uh, uh, but a prominent electronegative uh, uh, environment. And this, we thought, could explain why it was a non-selective cation channel. It was a large pore, uh, disordered, not bound to ions present. And so we said, if that's the case, if it's an electrostatic model, maybe we can change it into a chloride channel, and that would create an inhibitory channel. So we worked on that. We did a lot of screening in neurons, uh, expressing mutated opsins. We used whole cell patch clamp as our readout. I won't dwell on the details, but we were able a year ago to effectively reline the channel, turning it from largely uh, negative to largely positive, and indeed that then became a chloride anion conducting channel that was inhibitory, and we call this IC1C2 inhibitory, and that's a chimera of two channel rhodopsins. This came out uh, back to back with a very nice paper from Peter Hegemann's lab, 
but we, all the, that, those papers and uh, other subsequent uh, work was all in culture, and we had to work to improve those, and there's some unpublished work now that I wanna very briefly share with you in one or two slides. We have a next generation version of this that's got vastly greater uh, photo currents. Uh, we've added some additional mutations to make it even more positive inside, so we call this IC++, next generation, and it's more positive as well. We can inhibit very robust, uh, very strong input currents, more than nanoamps of currents and shut off spiking. And we can make it bistable, by which I mean we can give a pulse of light and keep it shut off uh, for a while. And we did that using some uh, bistable mutations that we'd identified for excitatory opsins back in 2008. And in this case, we can give a pulse of light and keep it shut off uh, for a number of minutes. So this shows some of the uh, complexity and the opportunities of poor engineering and understanding the proteins themselves, which is, uh, 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 I think, given their, uh, the beauty of these molecular machines, it is an end in itself. And now we and many others are finding new opsins, including chloride, naturally occurring chloride channels, uh, including one from uh, John Spudich's group, and they all seem to fit this pattern of having this uh, more uh, uh, positive uh, pore lining. And some work from Sheena Jocelyn and Paul Franklin's group has shown that this uh, IC++ may be more behaviorally uh, active than the uh, initial first generation IC1C2. So that's an exciting final bit of work, and I just want to close with uh, some uh, broader, uh, one, one or two broader slides about our, uh, uh, you know, um, educational uh, 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 efforts. This is one of the most uh, uh, rewarding things to have people come and visit the lab and, and do some uh, work learning some of these methods and often people will send back uh, pictures of their work. This is from one of our Clarity workshops from uh, King's College and this is another group from Vanderbilt sending back their uh, clear brains. There's a, a group that's doing now plant Clarity and they, they this is published, uh, they showed some of their transparent leaves which uh, I'm, uh, you know, I, I appreciate plants uh, too, but I didn't uh, uh, fully appreciate the, the value of, of leaf transparency. Um, I think I'll end there, and I, I think I mentioned uh, the key names along the way, but summarized uh, again here, uh, and particularly the work I focused on, uh, Priya uh, Abhishek and uh, Talia and Andre Berendt uh, and Sue Lee led the re-engineering of the, the uh, channel rhodopsin. And I want to thank all our collaborators here and elsewhere. Uh, thank you for your time, and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you.